Morning Church, how are you doing? I hope you have uh, adjusted well to the COVID-19 situation thus far. And during this time that you have found Jesus to be near you and growing as a disciple of Christ. This August, we will embark on a new series based on the book of James. And the series is called, Are You For Real? Let us commit this morning's service into God's hands. Let us pray. Dear Father God, Lord, we want to thank you that you love us, that you gave your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for us. And we remember you this morning and to give thanks and praise to you. So Lord, we pray that during this morning, as we worship you, Lord, may you minister to us through the songs. Lord, we pray this morning that you open our hearts, that the Holy Spirit, you speak to us through your word, through the preacher, that we will know you more and more. That, Lord, you give us the courage, the boldness, and the strength to respond to you this very morning, that we continue to grow to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we commit ourselves into your loving hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Revelations 4, 6 to 11. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy, Worthy are, are you, our Lord, Lord and God, God to, to receive glory and, and honor and power for, For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created.
belong all the glory and honor and power and praise. And Lord, we give you thanks. But church, I know that for some of us, we are really in a hard season to praise the Lord and we struggle. Some of us may have lost our jobs. Some of us are struggling with relationships, with ill health, mental or emotional stress. And yet others are struggling to put food on the table. And the list goes on. And we question where is God in all this? Why are we going through this? Why does a good God allow suffering? How do we praise God? How is God still good? But church, we need to come back to the Father and to know His heart. And to know that the Father loves us deeply, dearly. And I pray that as we come before Him and sing this song, that you open your heart to Him and you allow Him to love you.
Father, we praise you because you are good. Father, when the world around us is crumbling, help us to remember that you are good, that you never change. We know that you have a plan to prosper us and to harm us, a plan to give us a hope and a future. And God, we know that when we seek you with all our hearts, you who are faithful who will be found. And so remind us, O oh God, of your goodness, of your faithfulness, that you never leave us nor forsake us.
your faithfulness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 to 10. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. For when I am weak, then I am strong.
every single one of us. Thank you, God, that you are seated on your heavenly throne. Thank you for your goodness and faithfulness. Thank you that you make all things beautiful in your time. Thank you that our identity is secured in the blood of Jesus. We praise you, God. We love you. In Jesus' most mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. Let us now prepare our hearts to partake in the Holy Communion that our Lord Jesus has established for us. The Holy Communion is a time where we come together as a body of Christ to remember what Jesus has done for us. Therefore, it is for all who have believed, confessed and accepted Jesus as Lord and Saviour. If you have not yet believed in Jesus, please refrain from partaking. Let me now read a portion of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 29 regarding the Holy Communion. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul said, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, we ought to examine ourselves before we eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Let us now take a moment to confess our sins, whether knowingly or unknowingly, before God. Let us pray. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We will now partake of the Holy Communion. So please have your communion elements ready. It could be bread, biscuit, grape juice or rabina. If you are partaking as a family, can I invite the head of the household to serve the communion elements to your spouse and also to your children if they have understood the meaning of Holy Communion and has come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So please serve them. I believe we are all ready. Please uh, take the bread in your hand. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for us. Let us eat of the bread in remembrance of him. Let us now hold the cup. This is the blood of Christ, which is shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us drink of the cup in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. And we, whom the Spirit lights, gave light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ from Bartley Christian Church. This Sunday, we are starting a new series on the book of James. When the leadership of this church was planning uh, to do the book of James from the pulpit, never did we ever thought that we would be preaching this series um, under the current situation and because of this I believe that this is a very apt word from God especially uh, the book of James which is known for its practical Christianity the practice of real faith the sermon title for us today from James chapter 1 is are you real in a recent interview with what are the thriving business and are doing well under the circumstances was an interview with a pawn shop owner and the pawn shop owner says that under current situation there are many people who bring things of value to the pawn shop to be pawned and the interviewer asked this pawn shop owner but how do you know that the items are real? How do you know that the items that are brought to your pawn shop are authentic, real, and pure? And the pawn shop owner replied that for every item, there's a series of tests and their, their knowledge of the signs of authenticity and purity for each and every item that is brought to the shop. So for example, if someone brings a Rolex watch, they have a series of tests and signs to identify that this Rolex watch is real. It's not a fake that is bought from Bangkok or anywhere else. If you bring a ring with a diamond to this shop, they will be able to establish again with clear signs and indications and tests that this diamond is an 18 karat diamond and its purity or if you bring a ring a gold ring to be pawned this pawn shop owner have a series of tests and signs to tell them how pure and how real is this gold ring and then they will evaluate uh, the item and give the price uh, to the person who has brought the item. So if there is a test and sign of authenticity and purity for every item on earth of, that is of value, surely there is also a test and a sign for faith, real faith. So the question is, is your faith real? So are you a real Christian? How do you know that your faith is real? This is the theme of the book of James. And the theme can be summarized in chapter 2, verse 14 and 18, where James asked the question, What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? But I will show you my faith by my works. So faith and works, one cannot be without the other. They are one and the same. Faith is by the grace of God that has given to us. But if there is genuine faith, that faith will be manifested and reveal itself through works of faith that comes from the enablement of God righteousness. So how do we know that our faith is real? What are the tests and the signs to prove to us that our faith is real? 1. Real faith rejoices in trials from verse 2 to 11. Number 2. Real faith rejects temptation but accepts God's perfect gift. 
And that can be seen in verse 12 to verse 18. Thirdly, real faith hears, receives, and obeys God's word. Verse 19 to 26. And the fourth point is that real faith has characteristics. What are the characteristics of real faith? And that is presented by James in verse 26 to verse 27. The first point, real faith rejoices in trials. We read, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Here we can see that James is the author of this letter, and he's not James the disciple of Jesus, he's James the just the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. But even though as a half-brother of Jesus, he sees himself and he knows that he is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he's writing this letter to the 12 tribes, Hebrew Christians, early Christians who, have, who was being dispersed after the persecution of Stephen in Acts. And they are now residing in many of the pagan nations in Asia Minor, being away from home, away from their comfort zone, they're experiencing challenges and difficulties. Yeah. So he says, James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, and it will be given him. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because he is like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flowers falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So the first test of real faith is that real faith rejoices in trials. But then we ask the question, how to be joyful in trials in the midst of trials it's painful it is difficult we are perplexed and and why why do we need to be joyful in trials and james answered that question in verse 2 to 4 because we know because we know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness and this testing of faith which produces steadfastness must have its full effect. It must be a constant response so that we may be perfect and complete at the end of it, lacking in nothing. And here we are reminded once again that the trials that we are facing are actually tests of faith that God has allowed us to go through and he has this long-term view, long-term plan, that this series of tests and trials will cause and call us into steadfastness and perseverance. And through perseverance and our steadfastness, we will become perfect, fully spiritually mature in God's sight. And this is what Eugene Peterson says and tells us, that discipleship is a very long obedience, but always in the same direction. 
our discipleship journey will take us on a long journey and along that long journey we will be facing different and various kinds of trials and testings but all these trials and testings are there to shape us to respond consistently steadfastly in faithfulness persevering through those tests and trials and we are assured with the knowledge that the difficult the challenges that we face now have a positive effect at the end and that is Christ will bring us into perfection, into complete spiritual maturity, pleasing in Him, lacking in nothing. So here we are reminded that only God can turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, a trial into a triumph, a victim into a victory. The second sign of why we can rejoice in trial and remain steadfast in trial is because God promises us His wisdom by our prayer in faith. It says that if any of us lack wisdom, let us ask God, who generously gives to all without reproach, it will be given Him. But let Him ask in faith with no doubting. In the midst of trials, sometimes we cannot see beyond the next step. And in the midst of suffering and challenges, we cannot see the reason why we are going through it. Why did God allow this to happen? And when we are in that situation, James calls us to pray, to pray for God's wisdom, to enlighten our eyes to see this world through the eternal perspectives of God. By praying in faith, we receive God's wisdom. And God's wisdom will enable us to look at our situation through His eyes, that the world is going to pass away. We are looking at the end, the completion of our faith, the perfection of our faith. That's why Psalms 25 verse 4 the psalmist calls out in the midst of his trial, Show me the path where I should walk, O Lord. Point out the right road for me to follow. And this is the prayer that all of us can take with us in our hearts. If you are going through certain challenges and you really do not know the way forward, pray this faith and ask God, to give you his wisdom, to show you the path where you should walk. Point out the right road for us to follow. Thirdly, is that God's wisdom enables us to persevere and live for his eternal purpose. And he gave us the examples of the poor and the rich brother both in their different situation with the wisdom of God, they see what is of real value in this life. So he says that let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, because even though he is lowly and poor, he is still a child of God. He can exalt in his status as a child of God. And the rich brother uh, also in his humiliation. He can exalt in his humiliation because all the resources that he has are not his, but are blessings from God and he has been given the responsibility to steward God's blessing. But for both the poor and the rich brother, both can see life like a flower on the grass, that each one of them will pass away. The forces of nature for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flowers fade and its beauty perishes. The rich brother and the poor brother is still limited to the forces of nature and one day they will pass on very quickly. Life is short. So they should see their poverty and see their riches only as transient and not eternal. But then, in comparison 
the rich man who does not know God, he will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. And that would be something none of us want to be in. The second sign or the second test of real faith is that real faith rejects temptation but accepts God's perfect gift. Verse 12 to 18, James writes, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who loved him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it, is, it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So James says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. For every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So the test for real faith, the second test is that it rejects temptation, but accepts God's perfect gift. When we have the wisdom of God, we are able to differentiate between a trial and a testing of God is different from temptation. But what's the difference? And James tells us that the difference is that trials are tests of faith. Temptation is not from God because God is holy and in his holy righteous character will never tempt us to sin. But the temptation, the source of temptation, first of all, starts from our personal desires. Right? And the test of faith is to produce steadfastness and perseverance in us, the positiveness of us. Whereas the temptation, beginning from the personal desires, begin to lure and entice us more and deeper to fulfill our personal desires, right? So we are enticed and we are lured. Trials and tests through perseverance and steadfastness brings us into perfection, spiritual maturity. Whereas temptation, beginning from our personal desires, we are led further, enticed and lured into sin. And sin will bring about death not just physical death, but more critical, spiritual death, a path that is a diversion from God's purpose and plan for our lives. So real faith in us will reject temptation and accept God's perfect gift. But what is God's perfect gift? We are to receive God's perfect gift through His word of truth. In verse 18, he brought us forth, he gave birth to us by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God has already implanted his word into our lives. From the implanted word, God springs forth spiritual birth through our faith in him. And this faith in him, this spiritual birth, uh, enables the presence of the Holy Spirit within us to bear fruits of the Holy Spirit, enabling us to be the best that we can be in the eyes of God to present our acts of obedience, our works of faith to God. And those who we are and what we do in His name glorifies Him and we become the best of God's creation bringing Him glory and honour through our lives that is perfected and complete, lacking in nothing. The third sign and test for real faith, 
is that real faith hears, receives, and obey God's word from verse 19 to 25. James says, Know this, my beloved brethren, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of men does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks in intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So the third test for real faith is that a person with real faith is a doer of the word and not hearers only. But to be doers of the word of God, we need to hear the word of God first, right? And to hear the word of God is to have a spirit that pays attention to God speaking. We need to develop an attitude expecting God to speak through His Word. So when we do our daily Bible reading, we don't go through the motion. Before we read the Word of God, we come before the Lord and acknowledge Him as the God who inspired His Word in the Holy Scriptures that we are about to read. And we ask the Lord to grant us his Holy Spirit that is in us to connect with our spirit so that our spirit will be able to attend and hear his voice when we are reading his word. And when we come before the Lord, we are coming before, we have to know that we are coming before a holy God, the creator of heaven and earth. And this saying is how our attentiveness to God proves he is a valuable to us whether we come with attention or not actually tells and reveals our own attitude of how valuable god is to us but besides hearing the voice of god we need to receive the word of god and to receive the word of god we have to clear the hearts and James here says, first uproot all filthiness and wickedness. We've got to make sure the soil of our heart is uprooted with all the sin, filth, and wickedness. And then we make the soil ready with humility, accept the implanted word. Because the implanted word, when received with humility, is able to save our souls. Now that we have heard the voice of God through the reading of His Word, we have received His Word by first uprooting all the filthiness of our lives and in our hearts, and then allowing the implanted Word of God to take root and to grow. Now we come to the most important stage, to obey the Word of God. Be doers of the Word of God and not hearers only. This is the sign of true and real faith, obedience to God. So here, James gives us the illustration of two men, the man with the mirror and the believer with the word. You see, the man with the mirror comes to the mirror and observes himself, and then he goes away. But when he goes away, he quickly forgets how he looks. And then it's of no value. He's deceiving himself by just looking and forgetting. But the believer with the word, 
looks intently into the Word of God. He looks intently in the Word of God, which means that he studies the Word of God closely. And there are many platforms for us to do this. The Bible study fellowship, precept, your inductive Bible study classes, groups, cell groups. When we look into the Word of God, we have to come into the Word, look into the Word of God with, with, with a genuine intention to hear the Word and the voice of God, to study it, to study it in detail, to know the will of God and His purposes, and not just merely go through the motion of Bible study and with no intention to do and to obey. And then, because when we, when we study, look into the Word of God and study it, and it helps us to remember the words of God, and when tests and trials come along, we are able to persevere with the Word of God, helping to sustain us and to endure, and we remain steadfast. And because we can act on the Word of God and in obedience, and we know that when we obey, God blesses us. We are only blessed in our doing. We are not blessed in our hearing. So, brothers and sisters, this is an important test of our real faith, that we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. But James also has another warning. He says, know this, anger does not produce the righteousness of God. So be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Because hearing, receiving, and obeying is so important, you must be quick to hear. But be slow to speak and slow to anger. Because when we speak too much and too fast, too quickly, without thinking, without processing what we are saying, very often we can be led to say the wrong things with the wrong spirit, in the wrong way, at the wrong time. And that could create frictions or disharmony between us and others. And most important of all, do not be so quick to, to be angry. Instead, James here, be slow to anger. And Alex Mott here is so wise to tell us that the great talker is rarely a great listener and never is the year more firmly closed than when anger takes over. So here, brothers and sisters, be careful. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and be slow to anger. The fourth sign of real faith is that real faith has got characteristics. And what are the characteristics we see in verse 26, 27? James says that if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So the three characteristics of real faith is a controlled tongue, a compassion to serve the needy, and a commitment to holiness. A controlled tongue, before we would speak too fast or too much, there are three questions that we can always ask ourselves to guard our tongue. Is, that, is this true, what we are going to say? Is it a kind thing that we are saying? And what we are saying, does it glorify and honour God? That's how we guard and control our tongue. Compassion to serve the needy is another sign of real faith. And this is done not by just words, but by actions and committed to holiness. True faith brings out a commitment to holiness because we are children of God. And as children of God, we are called to be like God. For God says, be holy because I am holy. And this three characteristics is going to be explained in deeper 
uh, in the following chapters about speech, about compassion for the needy, and a commitment to holiness. So my brothers, fellow pastors and elders will take turns in the following weeks to expand on these three areas. In closing, I'd like to summarize by this verse which I feel is very apt as a word of encouragement to all of us who are going through testing and trials. Right? And these are the words of Paul from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 to 18. Paul says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this current light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. So brothers and sisters, Whatever challenges and difficulties you are facing, take courage that your trials are tests of your faith that God has allowed into your life. And they are there to men to bring you through your steadfastness in responding on obedience to the word, your perseverance in acts of faith and obedience to the word and your end result that you are assured and promise is that you will be holy, complete, perfect, lacking in nothing. Let me pause for a moment of silence to just allow all this to sing in and I'll close with the benediction. Heavenly Father, very often we cannot see and cannot understand the trials that comes through our lives. Lord, we pray that your word in the book of James will once again awaken us to be able to know that these challenges, difficulties and trials in lives are there and allowed by you to test us, to test our faith, to shape us, to bring us through, to persevere, to endure, so that we are found steadfast as your child, trusting and believing in your promises to us that the work that you have started in our lives you will bring to completion. At the end of the trials, at the end of this life, Father, you will cause us, you will bring us, you will refine us as goal to completion. Pure, holy, perfect, lacking in nothing, in the likeness of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So Lord, give us wisdom, give us strength to persevere and remain steadfast and faithful in obedience to you and to your word, to your purpose, to your plan. Receive the blessing of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, 
the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So brothers, go into the week with faith to persevere and to remain steadfast through your trials in life. And God will bring you into his perfection. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I have um, an additional announcement to make. All of you, members of Bartley Christian Church, would have received an email from the church regarding our AGM in September. And because it's an EAGM, we have sent you the e-proxy form. I would ask you to very quickly fill up and return us that e-proxy form. That is a very important form to us because it registers your attendance and also your votes for what is proposed by the elders' board. So can I encourage you to quickly to go to that email that you receive and fill up that e-proxy form and send it back to the church with, according to the instructions on the email as soon as possible. Thank you.